Good morning. Good morning. So in 1938, Indiana Jones entered the Temple of the Sun. His father had just been shot by Nazis, and he was being forced, if you remember, in Indiana Jones in the Last Crusade. Hopefully I'm not spoiling anything. I think it came out in 1989. Um, so his father had just been shot, and the Nazis were forcing Indiana Jones to go into the temple to retrieve the Holy Grail. And so armed with his father's journal and seeing all the dead bodies of the people who had attempted to do what he, had just, what he was about to do before him, he walks into the first challenge in the Temple of the Sun to retrieve the Holy Grail. And in the first challenge, he's looking at his father's notes, and he's looking at his father's notes, and he knows the challenge. It's the, it's the pendulum challenge. And he sees the decap- decapitated bodies of the Nazis before him who had been, been, been volunteered to go in and try to attempt the challenge. And, and, and as you see Indiana Jones walking in, he's reading his father's notes, and he's saying, He's saying, only the penitent will pass. The penitent will pass. And then, and then uh, Steven Spielberg and George Lucas, they, 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 they move the camera over to his father, Sean Connery, Henry Jones, and, and his father who's just been shot and is gravely, mortally wounded with a, with a, a gunshot to his abdomen, is, is, is just reciting over and over, the penit- only the penitent will pass, the penitent will pass. The penitent will pass. And so as Indiana Jones comes into that first challenge, he understands that only the penitent man will pass this first challenge. And and it's as if he's trying to understand what that means. Even as he sees, like I said, the decapitated bodies around him. And then suddenly, suddenly, Indiana Jones says, the humble man, the humble man kneels, the humble man kneels. And he kneels down. Just as the God's breath comes through the cobwebs, he kneels down and he, he, he passes the challenge. The, the, the giant swords swing, but he, since he's bent down humbly before God, the, the giant swords go over his head and he, and he passes the challenge. Only the penitent man will pass. And that's what we're going to be talking about this morning. This morning we're going to be talking about how God has inexhaustible grace, inexhaustible grace, and how he wants to pour that inexhaustible grace on Christians because of what Jesus has done on the cross. We're going to be talking about what that means. We learn a little bit about what that means throughout the Bible in places like um, 2 Chronicles 34. In 2 Chronicles 34, we learn about an eight-year-old king named King Josiah who becomes king when he's eight years old. But later, when he's 26, he does something remarkable. He starts to, he's been starting to, to take down the bales and to remove all of the idol worship. And then he moves on to the temple and he starts trying to rectify the temple. And, and he sends funds to, to the workmen to, to fix the temple, which is in disrepair. And then suddenly somebody uncovers, kind of like Indiana Jones, un- uncovers the law that had been hidden for a long time. And when the king gets, gets word of that, he, he's excited. And then, and then what happens is the person, he has someone read the law to him, which, which had, been, had, had been hidden, it had, it had been discarded, it had, much like the, the grail probably um, of legend, it just had been forgotten about. And... King Josiah, as he listens to the law being read to him, realizes all the ways that Israel, God's children, chosen nation, has failed God. And what he does is profound. He rips his clothes, and he, and he cries, and he mourns in his posture. He, he kneels, and, he, and he's prostrate before God. And it's interesting, a little bit later, he goes to a prophetess, because they hadn't heard from God in quite some time. And they go to inquire of this prophetess about like what God thinks, what, 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 is, what is God's word for us. And God says something interesting. He says, he says to Josiah specifically, he says, because your heart was penitent and you humbled yourself before the Lord, because you've torn your clothes and wept before me, I have heard you. So today we're going to be talking about um, 
about humility, and we're going to be talking about being penitent before the Lord. I mean, we, we just sang, we just sang Healing Hope, and there's that section where it's like, He is always for us. He is always for us. He is always for us. And that's true. That's true. But what we're going to learn today is there are times where He opposes, is opposed to us. There, there are clearly times when He is opposed for us, opposed to us, even while He is always for us. <clears throat> so the first thing I want to do um, here in my notes, I guess, is easy, pray. I want to pray first, and then we're going to dive briefly, briefly into uh, the life of King David for, for, for a brief moment, because I think that will be, I think that will be helpful. So let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you. Thank you that you love us. Thank you that you sent your son to rescue us. Thank you that we were, even when, even when we were dead in our trespasses and sins, even then and even when, you sent your son to rescue us. That you had a plan from the beginning of of time, um, from before time even began, way back in eternity, you had a plan that you would rescue your, your creation, that you would rescue your image bearers through your Son. We thank you for that, Lord. We thank you that you, you do love us, that you are always for us, that you are always seeking, that your Son literally said, I've come to seek and to save the lost. And, and that's what he's still doing. He's still seeking seeking us out and he's still seeking and desiring to save the lost we thank you so much for that today as we go through what at least i think is is pretty convicting and pretty uh leveling and pretty humbling and uh, just a lot i just pray that you would help us that you would you would speak to us through your word I pray that you would, um, you would help us think through some of these things um, down deep where, where it matters um, in, in our hearts and that we would, we would wrestle with some of these things um, and that we would, we, would, uh, we would love you all the more for it and that we would celebrate you all the more for it and, and, and thank you so much um, and, and praise you for, for what you've done for us through Jesus. Help us now, we pray. It's in his name we pray, your son's name we pray, amen. Um, so in, before we get into James, like I said, I want to briefly look at the life of David because I think it's helpful. Um, and you can turn there if you want. But in 2 Samuel 11, maybe some of you know the story, but in 2 Samuel ch- um, chapter 11, um, the very heading says what, what we're into is, is David and Bathsheba. And this is what it says. It says, in the spring... In the, spring of the year, uh, in the spring of the year, the time when the kings go out to battle, David sent Joab and his servants with him in all Israel, and they ravaged the Ammonites, and they besieged Rabbah. But David remained in Jerusalem. It happened late one afternoon when David arose from his couch and was walking on the roof of the king's house that he saw from the roof a woman bathing. And the woman was very beautiful. And David sent and inquired about the woman. Notice the verbs. David sent and inquired about the woman. And the one said, Oh, is this not Bathsheba, the daughter of Eliam, the wife of Uriah the Hittite? So David sent messengers. David took her, and she came to him, and he lay with her. Then she returned to her house. And the woman conceived, and she sent and told David, I am pregnant. If you remember this story, or even if you don't, the rest of the story is basically David strategizing, conniving, trying to figure out and manipulating the situation so that his sin isn't found out. And he, he, he ensures, after a little bit of doing, that Uriah, the wife of Bathsheba, would be killed in battle. And then eventually, he's able to marry Bathsheba and, and again, hopefully, the, the sin of it all is kind of hidden but it wasn't. 
It wasn't. And then in Psalm 51, we get to hear from David. Eventually, he realizes that his sin wasn't hidden as he so, as, he, as, he, as, as much as he tried to hide it, he realizes that it wasn't, and he's convicted. And what we're able to see in, in, in Psalm 51 is, is his, his prayer. And this is what it says. It says, Have mercy on me, O God, according to your steadfast love, according to your abundant mercy. Blot out my transgressions. Wash me thoroughly from my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. For I know my, transgress- my transgressions and my sin is ever before me. Against you and you only have I sinned and done what is evil in your sight so that you may be justified in your words and blameless in your judgment. Behold, I was brought forth in iniquity, and in sin did my mother conceive me. Behold, you delight in truth in the inward being, and you teach me wisdom in the secret heart. Purge me with hyssop, and I shall be clean. Wash me, and I will be whiter than snow. Let me hear joy and gladness. Let the bones that you have broken rejoice. Hide your face from my sins and blot out my iniquities. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. Cast me not away from your presence, nor take your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation and uphold me with a willing spirit. Then I will teach transgressors your ways and sinners will return to you. Deliver me from blood guiltiness, O God. O God of my salvation, and my tongue will sing aloud of your righteousness. O Lord, open my lips and my mouth would declare your praise, for you will not delight in sacrifice, or I would give it. You will not be pleased with burnt offering. The sacrifices of God are a broken and contrite spirit. A broken and contrite heart, O God, you will not despise. Do good to Zion in your good pleasure. Build up the walls of Jerusalem. Then you will delight in right sacrifices and burnt offerings and whole burnt offerings. Then bulls will be offered on your altar. We get, to, we get a picture into, we get to see David's prayer. We get to, a picture into the conviction of David. And, and what I'd like you to identify when you have time, check out verse, chapter 51. Um, take your time, mull it over. Um, and, and try to figure out what ultimately took King David down. And, 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 and how, did his rest, how did he get restored? How is his relationship with God restored? It, it's, it's there in Psalm 51. You, you can see it. And in, first, in 2 Samuel, you, you see what it is that took him down. And we're going to get into some of that today. But let's, let's get to James. James chapter 4, starting verses 1. Um, James chapter 4, starting verse 1. This is what it says. What causes quarrels and what causes fights among you? It's a question. Is it not this, that your passions are at war within you? You desire and do not have so you murder, you covet, and cannot obtain, so you fight and quarrel. You do not have because you do not ask. You ask and do not receive because you ask wrongly to spend it on your passions. You adulterous people, do you not know that friendship with the world is enmity with God? Therefore, whoever wishes to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God. Or do you suppose it is to no purpose that the scripture says he yearns jealously over the spirit that he has made to dwell in us? But he gives more grace. Therefore, it says, God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Submit yourselves, therefore, to God. Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Draw near to God, and he will draw near to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners. Purify your heart. You double-minded, be wretched and mourn and weep. Let your laughter be turned to mourning and your joy to gloom. Humble yourselves before the Lord and he will exalt you. In verses uh, one, to, uh, 1 to 4, James is, is after the problem. It's a problem that we've talked about before. It's a problem that we've, we've talked about regardless, really, of, of what, what book of the Bible we've been in, what passage we've been in. 
Um, I feel like it's, it's a problem that, that we can't stop talking about because it is so prolific, it's so dangerous, it's so, um, so challenging. It's the problem of the human heart. Jeremiah talks about it um, in chapter 17, verses 9 to 10. He talks about how the heart is deceitfully wicked. And it's deceitfully wicked and it's desperately sick. Even last week, we had, a, we had Corey talking about, um, just, just in chapter 3, just a few sentences up. He says, uh, verse 14, but if you have bitter jealousy and selfish ambition in your hearts, in your hearts, Jesus says, Jesus says, um, he says the, the good person produces good if there's goodness in him. The, the evil person produces evil because there's evil in him. He says, uh, all things, all evil things come from within. They come from within a person. And those are the things that defile a person. The human heart is desperately sick. It's, 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 it's deceptive. Because sometimes we think, don't we? We think that it's all the things that are outside of us that are causing causing us to sin, causing us to stumble. But that's not what the Bible teaches, and that's not what Jesus teaches. Jesus, Jesus teaches very clearly that it's it, what's inside of a person that defiles a person. But, but Jason, Jason, you don't understand. When I scroll, I see. When I drive, I see. At work, I hear. No, 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 no. I get all that. I live in the same world that you live in. I face the same things that you face. But it's in here. Recently I was talking to someone um, and I asked, I asked them the question, when the heat comes, when the heat comes, what happens in here? And they said, I just explode. That's what Jesus is talking about. When the heat comes, what happens in here? And that's what we're talking about. Look, look at it. James gets further, further into, into this in verses 1 to, one to 4. One, 1 to 4. What, what causes quarrels? What causes fights among you? He, he asks the question almost as if to, he's, he's writing to Christians and giving them a little bit of, it's not rhetorical. There are some rhetorical questions in here, but, but it's not necessarily rhetorical. He's just asking it. And maybe there were people who read this letter and they paused and they thought for a moment. What, what is it? What is it that causes quarrels amongst me and my friends? What is it that, that causes fights among me and the people I attend church with or the people I work with? What is it? And, and James says, it will, it's what's happening inside of you. Look, he says, he says, it's the passions, the passions that war inside of you. That's why. You have somebody at work, you have a friend, somebody who, who, who always wants to, to jump at conflict. A good question to ask is, what's going inside, on inside of you? If someone points out to you that, that you, you seem to, to snap for no good reason, off the handle... Maybe it's worth asking yourself, why is that? Verse 2, you desire, you do not have, so you murder. Remember what we read before? Remember King David? You desire, you do not have, so you murder. You covet, you cannot obtain, so you fight, and you cause conflict. That's what David did. David saw something that he wanted, and so he murdered he saw something that he could not have because it was not his. And he coveted, and he wanted it, and he took it, and he killed for it. You may not be literally murdering someone, but, but you ever, have you ever had the thought? Have you ever looked at someone, you know, the phrase, if looks could kill? It reminds me of the Sermon on the Mount. Maybe it does to you too. 
where Jesus is talking about anger. He's talking about lust. He's talking about enemies. He's talking about retaliation. He's talking about the things that happen here. And he's saying, he constantly says, you have read that it is said that if you commit murder, right? And then he says, but I tell you, even if you just say, I hate that guy. I hate that guy. You have done it. What was he doing? He was trying to show everyone that the law wasn't meant to... like. The law was meant to get, get us here. That's what he's doing. He's saying, it's in here. It's not the physical murdering of someone. It's, it's what's happening in here. And we're not going to touch too much on, on, on 11 and 12. But, he, but in 11, it says, do not speak evil against one another, brothers. The one who speaks against a brother or judges your brother speaks evil against the law. The law, what law? The Mosaic law? No, the law of love. The law that that Jesus proclaimed. I have a new commandment that you love one another as I have loved you. And here James is saying, don't break that law. It's the law of love. Jesus told us, he said, "I I have a new law for you. And here it is, that you should love one another as I have loved you. Then he goes on to say, he says, there's, he says, greater love has no one, no one than, greater love hath no one than this, right? Then he lay down his life for his friends. That is the type of love. Jesus gives, gives you the new commandment and he explains the commandment, what that means, and then he displays it for us on a cross. What does that look like? What does it mean? What does it mean to, to love your neighbor as your, like Jesus? What does that, that mean? He displays it on a cross. Die to yourself. Sacrifice yourself for the people around you. Here James is bringing up Jesus' words to the four. He's bringing them up. He's giving, and he's giving us practical, godly wisdom it's helpful to know you desire and you do not have so you murder you covet and you cannot obtain so you fight and quarrel you do not have because you do not ask prayer you don't ask sometimes you don't ask and I think that gets to what's going on in your heart as well but then there's the other side of it right you do ask and you do not receive Why? Because you ask wrongly to spend it on your passions. In many ways, this is talking to the Christian who's backsliding, but in a lot of ways, it's just talking to all of us who still have a sin problem. Because see, what Jesus does is, Jesus dies on the cross, and we come to faith in Jesus, right? In Romans 10.10, we believe in our hearts that, 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 that Jesus died for us, and we proclaim with our mouths, or we confess with our mouths that he is Lord, and we are saved. And immediately, Immediately, sin no longer reigns in us, but it remains in us. Amen? It does. It's still here. It's still in us. And sometimes sin gets in your way. It gets in your way. And here's what James says. You do not have because you do not ask. And you're probably not asking because sin's in the way. Then he says, or maybe you do ask, but you don't get what you're asking for. Because your intentions, those intentions can easily stem from a deceived and proud place. Too proud to ask, or like the self-righteous Pharisee. Remember Luke 18? Jesus tells a story about a publican and a Pharisee. And the Pharisee stands up and he prays and he says, Thank God I'm not like this poor publican, this loser of a person who's clearly sinful. Thank God I'm not like him and I'm not like all these people around me. And Jesus says something interesting about the publican. He says that the publican just stands there. And he just, he just 
smotes his breast, and he just says, have mercy on me. Have mercy on me. I'm a mess. And then Jesus says something. He says, he says that Pharisee leaves that temple, and he's not forgiven for anything. And he says, that publican leaves forgiven. Sometimes we ask. Sometimes we pray. And we pray in such a way we think our intentions are right. But don't forget your heart. The problem with the human heart is that it's deceitful. It's easily deceived. And there's, there's no worse deception than self-deception. Verse 4, it says, adulterous people, you adulterous people. Here, James reaches back to the Old Testament for our benefit, I think. And though it's hard to hear, he's referencing Isaiah, he's referencing Jeremiah, referencing all these places where God calls the children of Israel adulterer, adulterers. As if he is the husband and they are the wife and they have run out on him. And not just run out on him, but gone with other, other men. In fact, Hosea talks about this. It's most famous in Hosea because he brings this out. He literally has Hosea marry a prostitute so that he can have a, 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 a very prominent display of the relationship that, how, as God sees it. I am the one who has come seeking you. I am the one who came to rescue you. I am the one who, who has chosen, chosen you and you have run out on me. And the whole book of Hosea is about him having children with this prostitute and then constantly going and seeking her out constantly seeking to love her, constantly seeking to bring her back, constantly seeking to save her from her, from her, her, her sinful ways. And God's response to our adultery, to our, our, our change of allegiance, our identity as a traitor, as a turncoat, that's essentially what he's saying. It hasn't changed. He, he continues to pursue us. Just like in the book of Hosea, he continues to pursue us. Yes, there are consequences to actions. There's consequences to sin. There is discipline. But the kindness of God leads us to repentance. When you look at the book of Hosea, Hosea is entreating his wife back to him. He's entreating. He's, 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 he's kind in how he seeks to, to woo her back and bring her back. And God is the same way. In fact, in the Old Testament, there's a lot of law, but you can't, you can't find, there's, you can't tell me that there's no grace in here. It's on display across the Old Testament where God is just yearning and seeking out his people. Even as he, said, as, even as he pronounces curses and as he pronounces judgment, he says, but I'm going to fix it. I'm going to make a way. I'm going to send a shepherd. I'm going to send a rescuer. I am going to bring you back. I'm going to give you, a, I'm going to change your heart of stone to a heart of, of, of clay. I'm going to change you, get that heart of stone out, out of you so that you can respond to me in the way that you should be responding to me. Give Hosea um, 14 a, a read at some point. It, um, it's, it's God's plea it's the end of Hosea. Where it's God's plea for the children of Israel to come back. Uh, we won't delve into it. Um, and then Ezekiel 37. There's, there's various places in Ezekiel, and a couple of places in Ezekiel, a bunch of places all over the place. We don't, we don't need to go there, even though they're in my notes. We're just going to be here all day. But, but there, it's constantly God is seeking to tell us one, about judgment for sin, and two, about rescue from sin. Thomas Guthrie, um, who a, was a preacher in like the, the 1800s, says, um, if you find yourself loving any pleasure, it's very helpful actually, if you find yourself loving any pleasure better than your prayers, any book better than the Bible, any house better than the house of God, any table better than the Lord's table, any persons better than Christ, any indulgence better than the hope of heaven, take alarm. Take alarm. Verse 4, I say deception, but it's also treason. He says, do you not know that friendship with the world makes you an enemy of God? That's what he says. And we might not know it, but we should. 
So James is telling us plainly, friendship with the world, and again, Corey was helpful in explaining this. We're not, Jesus, John 3, 16 exists. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever should believe in him should not perish but have eternal life. That is there. Jesus loves the whole world. We're not talking about, when, when, when James talks about the world here, he's not talking about that world, the world that Jesus died and came seeking to save. We're talking about worldly structures. We're talking about Genesis, when, when, when the city of men is created in Babel, and all these men get together and say, we don't need God, we can do this ourselves. And so, the, so they build Babel, they build a city to themselves. It wasn't so much that they were trying to reach God with a giant tower, it was that they decided that they didn't need God and they could just live life on their own. They could be great and glorify themselves. And ever since then, ever since then, there has been two worlds. There has been the city of God and the city of men and the structures of the world. And, and, and the Bible tells us that, that Satan is the, the prince of the power of the air, that he's in charge of this world. That's the world that we're talking about. And James is saying that, that, that perhaps we've been deceived. Maybe, maybe, maybe it's... Maybe it's like the, the frog or the lobster in the boiling pot that we're just steeped in the world every day. Remember Jesus' high priestly prayer. I pray that they would be in the world, not of it. I pray that, that, that you would keep them from the evil one in the world, even as they're in the world. We're not Quakers who go and live outside of the world. We're supposed to be living in the world, but we're not supposed to be of it. And here James is saying that, don't you know that if, you, if you're living in the world, you're, you're being, and you become corrupted by it, that's totally antithetical to what God wants. And so maybe it's deception. Maybe it's the, the lobster in the pot. Slowly but surely, the temperature goes up, and then before we know it, we didn't realize that we should have jumped out a lot sooner, but now we're in it. Or, or, or maybe it's just treason. I mean, does a rebel expect the king to pardon his treason while he remains in rebellion? No. And if he does, everybody just laughs at him in the court. Right? The guy who says, I don't need you! And then upon punishment says, please, please, even as one of his fists is raised, please spare me. No. No. It doesn't make sense. Verse 5. Verse 5 says, uh, Verse 5 says, He yearns. He yearns jealously over the spirit that he has made to dwell in us. Or do you suppose it is to no, no purpose that the scripture says he yearns jealously over the spirit that he has made to dwell in us. In Ezekiel 36, um, in Ezekiel 36, 25 to 27, uh, this is what it says. It says, uh, I will sprinkle clean water on you and you shall be clean from all your uncleanness and from all your idols I will cleanse you and I will give you a new heart and a new spirit I will put within you and I will remove your heart of stone and I will give you a heart of flesh. There's a couple ways that this is interpreted but what I think, what I think James is saying is that when he says he yearns the Holy Spirit's one job the Holy Spirit's job in residing inside of us is to point us to Christ. That's his job. That's his longing. That is his hope. That is his one job. Despite whatever you've heard about him, that's his one job. His job is to direct you and point you to Christ. The Holy Spirit inside of us is the means by which we become increasingly more and more like Christ. Christ. And I think when James says, don't you know that, that, that God yearns for the spirit that he's 
cause to dwell inside of you? That he's, he's yearning for when we're backsliding, when sin has, has, when we've allowed sin to take control, when we've become enslaved again, and, 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 and like we sang in Healing Hope, and, and, and neglected our freedom, and we've allowed ourselves to be enslaved again, I think James is saying that the God of the universe yearns for the Spirit to be able to do its job in us. I think he's, he's yearning, he's, he's maybe frustrated. That's not a great word. But he wants the Holy Spirit that's inside of us, that we're grieving, to be able to do his work. He's yearning for us is that the Holy Spirit would be able to complete his good work in us, which is you, me, increasingly conformed to the image of his Son. And I think the heart of God, it's like sadness that we've allowed ourselves to get enslaved again. When there's so much freedom in Christ. Verse 6. He gives more grace. Romans 2, 4 says it's the kindness of God that leads us to repentance. It's by grace you have been saved. And it's by grace we are sustained in the life we now live in Christ. That's a good verse. He gives more grace. But look at, who, look at how God's grace is provided. Verse 6. Verse 6. But he gives more grace. Therefore, it says, God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. See that? God's grace is poured out upon humble people. James says that the proud will always meet opposition from God. Think about like Nebuchadnezzar. Right? Nebuchadnezzar, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, Nebuchadnezzar, Daniel, Nebuchadnezzar. At a certain point, Nebuchadnezzar says, he looks out upon everything that he has created, that he thinks he's created, that he thinks he owns, and he says, look at all that I have done. And, and the Bible says that, that a voice came out of heaven and said, Nebuchadnezzar, you're done. And immediately, immediately, he lost his mind, and he thought he was a cow, and he went off into the fields to graze as a cow, for years and years and years. Because God opposes the proud. But the humble will see a faucet of grace turned on. And, and God's not facing a grace, grace crisis. He doesn't like live in California where there's like a grace crisis or something. He, he turns on the, the, the faucet and he just leaves it on and he walks away. On the humble person. He has no need to ration it. He just lets his grace flow over the humble. So yes, he is always for you. He's always for you. But take note. He's always going to oppose the proud. Even as he's for you. Those go together. Don't you know that he yearns for, this Holy, for the spirit that he has caused to dwell within you? Don't you know that? He's yearning. He is. But at the same time, he opposes the proud. He does both. He yearns for us. He wants us to be complete, lacking nothing in Christ, becoming increasingly more like Christ. 
and yet he stands in our way. He stands in our way. I'm thinking about what's, what's that, the, uh, the, the story in the Bible with the, with the donkey. I can't think of it right now, but the, the, the donkey and the donkey's trying to go and, and, and God, there's an angel of the Lord is in its way with a sword drawn and it can't, God is always going to oppose the proud. The solution. Um, so if we talked about the problem, the human heart, we're talking, we're, he, James is very, very helpful. He's very, very practical. And now he, he switches over to the solution. Um, when I was growing up, when I was growing up, um, hymns were a very central part of my life. Um, from the first time that my grandmother took the two hymnals out of the pew in front of her, turned to the number in both, and handed me one, like from then, then on, hymns were part of my life. Even, I couldn't even read yet. It's like, thanks, Grandma. I'm just going to look at these weird words. Um, but hymns, hymns have, have, and on any given day, there's, there's some coursing through my brain. Um, but there's one, it's, it's called, um, There's a Way Back to God. Um, and it says, the first stanza says this, There's a way back to God from the dark paths of sin. There's a door that is open, and you may go in. At Calvary's cross is where you begin when you come as a sinner to Jesus. I think that's helpful. Like, just like uh, word, lyrics from Healing Hope. Sometimes lyrics are extremely helpful as you're living your life, even if like Bible verses aren't immediately popping in your head. Because it's a good reminder that the same way that you came to Christ, you continue to live in Christ. When I had my surgery, my Achilles surgery, that's why I have this cane and why I'm limping around. When I had my Achilles surgery, just after my Achilles surgery, they sent me home with a bunch of things. They sent me home with um, like a 30 or a, lo- a, a significant supply of aspirin. Um, they sent me home with really serious ibuprofen. They sent me home with like a seven course, day course of uh, antibiotic. And they sent me home with a, a, a decent, not a tons, but, but a decent amount of Percocet for pain. And probably beside the Percocet, because I probably, you know, you just take that out. But if those, those main things, if I didn't take those, if I didn't take the aspirin while I was at risk of blood clots, and that wouldn't have been good. If I hadn't taken the course of antibiotic, I, I was at risk of, like, getting an infection, which was a very real risk. So if I had just said that, eh, I don't need it, uh, that wouldn't have been good. And, and the ibuprofen wasn't just for pain, it was for inflammation. Right? And, so, and if I had just dis- disregarded it, that, well, then maybe I would have been a lot more swollen. I would have, like, it just wouldn't have been helpful. Right? And so medicine had to play a part in my recovery. And if I neglected any of them, I was at risk. And that's true of most medications. Right? Go try to figure out strep throat apart from a decent course of, of antibiotic. I'm sure eventually it might go away, but, but it would help if you... But, and usually, have you ever noticed that on those pill bottles, usually it like tells you to take the entire thing? You can't just take one and have it take effect. In the same way, James here is providing a prescription for us. And perhaps it's fitting as we kind of eventually transition to communion. I think this will be helpful. The prescription that James writes here is, yes, it's for the backslider. It's for the Christian who may be falling away. It's certainly a helpful course of medicine for the Christian who has gone a little sideways. But I think it's helpful for every one of us. So if you're like Nebuchadnezzar wandering and grazing in the field, right, needing to come back, if you're like the prodigal son who's, who's, Head is in the, literally in the, in, the, in the pig trough, right? This is, this is good stuff for, for that Christian. But it's also helpful for us because I think, because I think it, if I were to go up and down the aisles here and just took a little survey and just asked you the question, what if you could have access to God and his grace continuously? like that faucet I mentioned. 
like a river that's always bursting its banks. What if that kind of grace was on offer to you and you could have it? I think each person in here, man, woman, child, would say, that sounds, that sounds amazing. God, yes, I would love that. And if that's the case, well, then James's instruction is really, really helpful. And here's his prescription. Verse 7, submit yourselves to God. Submit yourselves to God. Like Jesus, Jesus is, 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 is the example. He's the, he's the example of perfect submission. He literally says the son can do nothing by himself. He can only do what he sees his father doing. Jesus was in perfect submission to his father. So first, submit yourself to God. If you're a rebel right now, if you're a traitor right now, submit Submit. Submit to the king. Submit to the Lord. Verse 7, he also says, resist the devil and he will flee from you. Again, Jesus' example. 40, 40 days, um, 40 days and 40 nights, right? Not eating, just praying, and then Satan shows up to tempt him. What does he do? Jesus is in the wilderness. He, this, Satan flees before him for a more opportune time, yes. But he flees him, flees from Jesus. Why? Jesus resists Satan with two things. He just spent 40 days praying and not eating. And he resists, so prayer, and through God's word. Every time Satan's temptations come up, he responds with truth. From God's word. Even on the last time when Satan shows up with God's words in his mouth, Jesus is able to identify the issue, how incorrect, how incorrect the usage is, and to respond with God's word. But how are you going to res resist the devil if you're not submitting to God? The godly life is characterized by its conflicts with sin. That's just what it is. If you're a Christian here today, take note. A godly life is characterized by conflict with sin. But notice that you're not alone. You're not alone. This isn't the six steps to flee sexual temptation by applying Joseph's life. That's not what this is. You're not alone. The armor of God in Ephesians is helpful. How can you expect to resist the devil without truth, righteousness, the gospel, faith, the confidence of salvation, the word of God, prayer? You can't. Then he says in verse 8, he says, draw near to God. Remember how I said before, how did you initially come to Christ? You initially came to Christ in faith. Draw near to God. How? How do I do that? Do it the same way that you came to him initially. And listen to what he says. He says, draw near to God and he, would, he will draw near to you. Have you considered how this God of ours seeks us out? The prodigal son. The prodigal son. Draw near to God and he will draw near to you. Look at the prodigal son as an example. The prodigal son lifts his head up out of the pig trough and says, I need to go home. I need to go repent. I need to go tell my father that I'm sorry. And on his way back, the Bible says that the father sees the son on the road afar off. And he hikes up his robes and he runs. And he greets his son with a hug and a kiss. That's what we're talking about. Draw near to God and he will draw near to you. Doesn't that picture just sound amazing? Cleanse your hands. Cleanse your hands in verse 8. Practical holiness. 
Have you, been, have, you, have you been living as a rebel? Have you been living as a traitor? James's advice is helpful. Clean up, clean up. Cleanse your hands. Remember when the, Jesus is washing the disciples' feet and Peter says, wash all of me. And Jesus says, no, I don't need to wash all of you. I just need to wash your feet. Be careful, little hands, where you go. Be careful, little hands, where you go, because you have a Father up above who's looking down in love, so be careful, little hands, where you, what you do. Be careful, little feet, where you go. Be careful, little hands. Sorry, I confused that. But that was something I used to sing when I was a kid, and it's still true. A kid can sing that song and understand it. An adult should be able to sing that song and understand it as well. Where are my hands? What are my hands doing? Where are my feet going? What is my mouth saying? And if I'm a Christian, if I'm in Christ, should I be saying the things that I'm saying? Should I be doing the things that I'm doing? Should I be going the places where I'm going or not? Purify your hearts. You double-minded. Interesting, in chapter 1, James talks about being double-minded. He says, don't, don't expect, double-minded person, don't expect that when you ask for wisdom, you'll get anything because you're not going to get anything because you're double-minded. You're unstable in all your ways, he says. And here, James says, purify your hearts. Separate, sanctify. You have a split mind. You are seemingly prepared to be on a fence, but you can't be on a fence. Those two things don't go together. The world, the world, your sinfulness, and, and, and the Holy Spirit in your heart do not go together. So identify and separate the two. Discard the refuse, clean house, purify your heart. Then he says in verse 9, be wretched, mourn and weep, as opposed to joyful laughter. Meaning, your posture is important in repentance. What is the posture of a Christian who is convicted of sin supposed to look like? It's not laughing. It's not joyful it's not. The salvation provided to us by Christ is free, from, free for us, but costly for him. Should we just laugh? Make a joke? Make light of it? Faith and repentance go hand in hand. The person who has faith in Christ grieves because of sin and is resolved to turn from their sin in the future. That's how it works. I have faith in Christ. I am a Christian. I fall into sin. I, repentance is important. And then repentance and forgiveness go hand in hand. Repentance and forgiveness have to go hand in hand. Sometimes, we do this. We do this. Sometimes we just, don't worry. God loves you. Don't worry. God loves you. He's always for you. There's nothing that you can do to make him love you less. So don't worry. Just go live your life. Faith and repentance go hand in hand. I mean, sorry, sorry, sorry. Repentance and forgiveness. How can you walk around saying, I'm forgiven, I'm forgiven, I'm forgiven, if you've never repented? I submit that that's impossible. I submit that that's impossible. I think it's impossible for you to walk around excited about being forgiven in Christ without repenting from sin. First John tells us, if any of you say that you don't have sin, you're a liar. So walking around, I'm forgiven, I'm forgiven, I'm forgiven. I can live however I want. I'm forgiven. That doesn't make any sense. You can live however you want because you're forgiven? It makes no sense. It makes no sense. 
If you're just always happy to be in Christ and be forgiven and don't worry, I'm forgiven, but you've never actually knelt down. You've never actually fallen on the ground in repentance. I just don't think it makes any sense. God listens to the humble. He listens to the penitent. He listens to the publican who beats his breast and repents. He doesn't listen to the Pharisee who says, thank you so much, Jesus, for rescuing me. Thank you so much that I get to leave here on a Sunday morning and go live my life during the week as I see fit and as I want because you rescued me. And then he says, then he says, humble yourself before God. And what I just say touches on this a little bit. Humble yourself before God. The worst kind of pride is Christian pride. Look at what he says in, in chapter 11. He says, this is after all this. He says, he says, okay, you've done this work. You've gone through the whole prescription. You started with submit to God and you ended with humble yourself before God so that he might exalt you at the right time. Okay, you've done all that work. That's great. That's amazing. That's wonderful. And then in verse 11, he says, now you who say to your brother something evil against your brother. Right? It's so easy for, for Christian pride to seep in. Maybe I'm the only one who's done this. But you start looking down your nose at other people and you start thinking that you're better than they are. You're better than they are. You're not as bad off as that person is. And that gives you some little weird feeling of, of like I'm, maybe I'm not as bad as I thought I was. There's no, there's no worse pride than Christian pride. The Pharisee who stands there and says, thank you for your rescue. Thank you for rescuing me. And, and look at all these other people around here. Poor them. Conclusion. Notice what he says. He says, humble yourself before God. And then he says that he will exalt you. God's elevator. God's elevator and we don't have to get in, all into it all. But if you check out Psalm 51, at the end, at the end of David's psalm, he says, he goes through all the penitence. He goes through all the repentance. And then he says, then. One's, almost like he's on the other side of it. He's forgiven. He says, then I will treat, teach transgressors your ways. Then I will sing your praise. He comes out the other side of it. If you look at Ephesians 2, you're dead in your trespasses and sins, but Jesus has, has, has rescued you and he's seated you up above. And then what does it say? It says that he's given, he's, he's pre prepared good works so that you should do them. The exalt is eventually in heaven, in glory, exalted. But the exalt is rescued ransomed, forgiven, so that I can keep doing the work, exalted to, the, to, to, to a status of being a good, a, a clean vessel who can go out and do the work. It's both. It's, it's one day in heaven exalted in glory. Where, where the, and even then, the, the Bible talks about the crowns that we get for the, the things that we've done here. After all the stubble and the, and the garbage is gone, the crown that we're left with, the Bible says we're going to take that crown that we're given and we're going to lay it down at his feet. So humility never goes away. And here, the, the, the exaltation that I think James is talking about is doing the work, understanding my heart is wicked, doing the work, submitting to God, making my way all the way to, to humble myself. And the exalt is going back to work, going back into ministry, going back to the great commission, the calling to which you've been called. That is the, the exaltation. That is God exalting you.
Sorry, it's 11.30, and I feel like I see kids coming in and coming out. I feel like I'm going long. I didn't mean to go long. It's a challenge I have. I'm working on it. But I don't really care. Honestly, I, I, I don't care. Because this is serious business, right? Like, this, uh, this is important. If you're a Christian in this room and you've fallen away and you want to know how to get back, this is good medicine. I'm telling you. This is it. If you're a Christian in this room, you're in Christ and sin has creeped in or you become a rebel and you ask yourself the question, how would I ever get back? How would I ever get back? This is the prescription for getting back. It's important. In Christ, this is important because there is something for you to do. There is something for you to do. Sometimes in Christianity, we talk about, oh, it's, it's, it's what Christ has done. It's everything, it's not, it's, it's what Christ has done on our behalf. And that is true, that is true. But if you're a Christian in this room and you're wondering, how do I get back? How do I get back? Submit yourself to God. Resist the devil. He will flee from you. Clean up your dirty hands. Purify your heart. Change your posture. Repent. God listens to the penitent. He listens to the humble. Micah 5, whatever it is, 5, 8. This is the man or woman to whom I will look, right? The person who is humble before me. It's important. And I think it's especially important with communion here. Because I don't know, if you're like anything like me, sometimes I dread communion. Sometimes I don't even want to get it. Take it. And this is helpful. Because the work is done here. I hope that makes sense. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you. Thank you for the rescue. Thank you for your son. Thank you for all that you've done for us. Pray that we would humble ourselves. That we would repent from sin that we would seek to live holy lives, that we would live lives that are worthy of the calling to which you've called us. We need you. We need you more than ever. We need you. We're so thankful for, for salvation and rescue. We thank you so much for, for your son, who is not only an amazing example of how to live our lives as Christians in this world, but that he is not just an example, that he's a rescuer, he's a redeemer, that he died and rose again to purchase us, to make us yours. It's in your son's name we pray. Amen.